Either, either we're going to have an atomic fire or we're going to have Holy Ghost fire. Settle for one or the other. Either we're going to have Holy Ghost fire or this generation is going to hell fire. Now where are the men who are going to bring the fire down from heaven? They don't sit in committee meetings. I don't read the, uh, that, that Elijah said, well I've got a promising young student by the name of Elisha. I'm going to have a day off and talk with him. He didn't go to what elders there were in Israel either. Elisha again didn't say, Oh God of Abraham, God of Moses, who split the waters and divided the Red Sea. Oh, that's dusty history. He said, I've been living with a man, Elisha, and when that man stood, king trembled. When that man spoke, the dead were raised. Elijah wasn't born in a day for sure. He had to have years of quietness and then out of that he had to come and publicly display that faith and courage that God had been building into him for those three and a half years alone. But boy, the nation it soon knew when he came. Let a prophet of God arise in the true sense of the word. He won't need any advertising plans. He won't need to get on public TV the magnetism is the abiding presence and power of God. Very good evening to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me as always. Welcome back. We left off in the final chapter of 1 Kings last time with the death of Ahab, 1 Kings 22. We will pick up now in this single Bible study. We're going to be going over the final events of Elijah and Elisha taking up his mantle and proceeding with Elijah's work because Elijah's work does not complete with him it does with Elisha we begin in 2 Kings 1 then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab Moab over here had been under the dominion of the Israelites since the time of King David, some 150 years before this time that we're talking about. Now they're rebelling. Ahab is dead, <coughs> and his son Ahaziah has taken control of the northern kingdom, and now Moab is rebelling. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Beelzebub was a god of the Philistines that was worshipped by the Philistines in the land of Ekron. He is viewed, even in the New Testament, he is compared and likened unto Satan. When Jesus, he heals this blind and mute man, also demon-possessed, once that he heals this man who is horribly afflicted, could you imagine being blind, couldn't speak, dumb, as it's called, and demon-possessed, and then Jesus comes up and heals every bit of it? What a great miracle. Well, the Pharisees turn around and they say this to Jesus. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Ain't that something? That always takes me aback. And Jesus knew their thoughts. And said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. So even Jesus acknowledged that this Beelzebub is a demon. And before we go any further, just one real quick note on this. Ahaziah fell down through the lattice in his upper chamber. It's believed by some that he was looking out of this lattice, which would have been kind of like a medium-sized window in his upper chamber. But I believe that the more plausible explanation would be that he was leaning on it, maybe thinking that it was locked, and it wasn't locked, and he just accidentally fell out. Some of the uh, commenters actually say that, too. So these messengers are being sent by King Ahaziah, who is now hurt. He's sick. 
He's laying up in his bed, and he tells them, go to Ekron and inquire of Beelzebub. Basically, go ask Satan what is to become of me. But who do they meet along the way? Or rather, who meets them? But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say unto them, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that ye go to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? meaning in the Philistine land. Now therefore thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. And when the messengers turned back unto him, he said unto them, Why are ye now turned back? So the kings asking, What are y'all doing here? It, I was quick. And they say, oh, we, they didn't even recognize Elijah. They didn't know who Elijah was, but the king knew who he was. He had seen him in the court of his father, Ahab. But they actually stop in their tracks from going and doing what the king commanded them. <clears throat> and they come back to the king and tell them, tells him what Elijah said. Russell H. Dilday actually says this, There must have been an irresistible quality to Elijah's personality, a forceful spiritual presence that compelled them to obey this stranger even though they didn't know who he was it does seem like when men are so filled with the presence of the lord that these unbelievers are moved in a way that it's it's not of the normal man it's in the, the supernatural sense jesus right after he gets done praying in the garden of gethsemane right before his trial and crucifixion Judas brings these guards up to them and they say, Art thou Jesus of Nazareth? And he says unto them, I am. Well, we're told right after that verse in John 18 that as soon then as he said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. These guards did, all of them. And this is an eyewitness. John was there with him. Peter, James, and John were in the garden with him. So he witnessed this once that Jesus said, I am. That some force blew them onto their back. This, uh, something about these kind of men. And it should be the same with us. When we are around people, the Spirit of the Lord should resonate from us in such a manner that people, we don't have to have such a supernatural reaction, but people should change their language. They should feel like cursing God is, they should feel how dirty that it is at that point. They should feel a, a reverence for the God in whom they may not even believe in away from us. But once that they get around us, then they start to have respect for this being in whom they know very little about. So King Ahaziah is asking these messengers, Why are you back so soon? And they said unto him, There came a man up to meet us, and said unto us, Go, turn again unto the king that sent you, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Is it not because there is not a god in Israel that thou sendest to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And he said unto them, What manner of man was he which came up to meet you and told you these words? And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. It's mostly the popular belief on Elijah's appearance was that he was a hairy man, such as depicted right here. But there's also a, a bit of a differing in that. John Gill says this, Either the hair of his head and beard were grown very long, having been much neglected for a great while, or he had a hairy garment on, such as John the Baptist wore, who came in his spirit and power and imitated him in his dress, being also, as Elijah, here. Very possible. Of John the Baptist it reads, And the same John had his raiment of, ca of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins. And his meat was locust and wild honey. But notice he has the same kind of leather. And the other thing that distinguished him from everyone else was the common apparel of a prophet. And it was a, an apparel of repentance. It was this camel's hair or goat's fur that they would wear on them. So it's kind of believed that maybe Elijah wasn't just this hairy fella, but he was much like John the Baptist, and he just wore a hairy garment. 
Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. So the king, who's still in his bed, crippled, sick, he sends this, these fifty-one soldiers, one of them being a captain, and Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. Adam Clark says this, Some have blamed the prophet for destroying these men by bringing down fire from heaven upon them. But they do not consider that it was no more possible for Elijah to bring down fire from heaven than for them to do it. God alone could send the fire, and as he is just and good, he would not have destroyed these men had there not been a sufficient cause to justify the act. Again, also, the king sent unto Elijah another captain of fifty with his fifty, and he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. So he's aggravated. You can tell he's got an aggravation about him. And Elijah answered and said unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. And the king sent again a captain of the third, fifty with his fifty. And the third captain of fifty went up and came and fell on his face, uh, fell on his knees before Elijah, and besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these fifty thy servants be precious in thy sight. You see, these other ones were arrogant. And if you'll remember on Mount Carmel, how Elijah and the Lord showed it very clearly, how Elijah was the servant of God. So whatever you did to Elijah, you were doing to God. It's much like Paul on the road to Damascus and Jesus, he's blinded by his sight. And Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He doesn't say, why did you just have Stephen stoned? He says, why persecutest thou me? God takes it personal whenever his children are under attack by the world. And these first two captains and these first two fifty, they come up and they're demanding something of Elijah. They're, they're forcing him. They're saying, you come down. The second one says it even more. He says, come down quickly. So God destroys them, and it's probably because they may have taken him and beaten him along the way, put him in change, mocked him, and God didn't want any of that. Well, this last one, they've learned their lesson. They don't want to die. And Elijah, as I've thought this whole time about him, he's a walking testament of God's power. Everyone, even his very name means Jehovah is God, so... Uh, it's just, uh, you just know for a fact, whenever you see Elijah, tremble. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, Go down with him, be not afraid of him. He arose, and he arose and went down with him unto the king. And Elijah said unto Ahaziah, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it not because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, Thou shalt not come down off that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. So Ahaziah's brother, Jehoram, or Joram, he takes over after only two years of Ahaziah. Both of these, Ahaziah and Jehoram, are the sons of Ahab. When, even while Jehoram is reigning in the northern kingdom, Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, is reigning in the southern kingdom of Judah. But I do believe Russell H. Dilday gives good summary of the short reign, two-year reign of King Ahaziah. He says everything he did was weak, faithless, and miserable. He achieved nothing but ruin and failure. 
He let Moab rebel. He hurt himself in a clumsy accident. He foolishly attempted to use military force against Elijah. And worse, he sought help in the wrong place in Philistia at the altar of a pagan god. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaziah which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Now for chapter 2 of Second Kings, right here we will be seeing the momentous taking up of the prophet Elijah. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Gilgal being right kind of north, uh, southwest of Samaria, the capital, coming down here to Bethel. All of this pagan land right here. But there's also a little school of prophets in each of these places that they go. And it's almost as if Elijah is making one final trip to give these sons of the prophets his final word to them. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. This is a test that Elijah is giving Elisha. It's his final test. And he's saying, You stay here, and I'll go on, on my own. But Elisha knows that, it's, that that's a test. He says, Nope, I'm to stand by you this whole time. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yeah, I know. Hold ye your peace. So the word had gotten around to the prophets. Perhaps the Lord let them in on this being the final goodbye for Elijah possibly the day before, possibly an hour before Elijah shows up. The Lord let these prophets in on this by some means. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. Part of the test may also be, if you'll notice that Elijah, he's making these stops at these schools of prophets, and this may be a showing of Elisha. Do you want to be with all of these or do you want to walk with me? And also, as you'll see, Bethel to Jericho. So he's making his way across the Jordan. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha <clears throat> and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yeah, I know it. Hold, your, hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Tari, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they went, the two went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. So it makes his way to Jericho, cross here to Jordan. This would have been, they're coming very close to the area in which Elijah would be very familiar with, Tishbe which is where he also grew up. Also notice that there's 50 prophets watching from the Jordan. So there, it's not just Elijah and Elisha at the Jordan whenever this next verse occurs, but these, these prophets are watching them. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. So Elijah right here, he joins Moses and Joshua with experiencing the Lord parting the waters for him. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. F.B. Meyer says this, It was the object of testing the spirit of his friend that the departing seer had urged him again and again to leave him. And it was only when Elisha had stood the test with such unwavering resolution that Elijah was able to give him this carte blanche. Carte blanche. 
And that is the freedom to do whatever he wants. Carte Blanc. Back in Deuteronomy 21.17, we read this. But he, meaning a husband, shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn. Now, I have to explain this just a little bit. Back then, if a husband married two, if he had two wives and he hated one and he loved the other, much like Jacob and Rachel and Leah, the husbands were bad about showing more favor to the offspring of the wife and whom they more favored. Well, this verse right here is telling them don't do that. But he, the husband, shall acknowledge the son of the hated wife for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath. For he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So all that Elisha is asking of Elijah is, and of the Lord ultimately, is reassurance that he will be the successor of Elijah. That the same ability, that the same favor will be showed unto Elisha as it was Elijah, and it certainly is, as Elisha actually, uh, the, he does more than Elijah does. And Elijah said, "Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so." And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold. There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So right there is Elijah being taken up by a mighty whirlwind, some type of tornado, supernatural tornado, no doubt. But if you'll notice how this chariot of fire separates them, many people believe that Elijah is taking up, he's taken up in this chariot of fire. Some of the scripture says the scripture never does even talk about the chariot of fire going up into heaven with him. All that it speaks on is this chariot of fire, chariot of fire. It appears with these fiery horses and uh, it splits the two because this whirlwind was no doubt pretty large and it would have taken up Elisha with him. But before we get into that, let's just I love the commentary by F.B. Meyer right here about what were they talking about right before that happened? Because it says that they walked and they talked just a little ways longer. F.B. Meyer commented, What sublime themes must have engaged them, standing as they did on the very confines of heaven and in the vestibule of eternity, the apostasy of Israel and its approaching doom, the ministry just closing with its solemn warnings, the outlook towards the work upon which Elisha was preparing to enter. Wonder what they talked about. But then this chariot of fire all of a sudden swoops down, separates the two. Must have been a bizarre sight. And as far as we know, Elisha has never seen anything that impactful, that miraculous. So this must have been very jarring for him. John Gill said this, There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Either angels in this form in which they appeared for the glory and honor of the prophet. This chariot drawn with these horses was not seen in the heaven, but as running on the earth and came between the two prophets. We'll learn later about how Elisha, he has a servant and they're in a pretty dire situation. And he asked the Lord to open the eyes, the spiritual eyes of his servant, so that he can see the army, the spiritual battle going, taking place all around them. And he actually witnesses these chariots of fire uh, formed things. And, and I do agree with John Gill. I believe that they're angels, like shape-shifting angels. Maybe they shape-shifted into a form that would be recognizable to the two men. Jameson Fawcett Brown said, There appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, some bright effulgence, which in the eyes of the spectators resembled those objects. They would have appeared to them as chariots of fire. What they truly were, we don't know. But what about this whirlwind? What was it like, do you think? 
John Gill said, And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven, body and soul, such a change passing on him as he went through the region of the air, which divested him of his mortality and corruption and fitted him for the invisible world. I wonder what Elijah was thinking at that very moment. This man had never been above the elevation of mountains. All of a sudden now he's taken up into not only the sky, but outside the universe and into the third heaven outside of all of these. What a moment. Oh, man, to have been there. I personally believe that the prophets at the Jordan may have even been witness to this. Also notice the attitude of Elisha upon seeing this, much as like uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, we see a, a very a changed man after witnessing such a thing. He's also very sad about Elijah going. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He's, he's screaming as a man in utter shock. The chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He's astounded. He doesn't know what to say. So I'd say that he just kind of sits down and cries for a little while. And then he gets up. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. This is actually a picture of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, Ye shall not send. He's telling them, You're wasting your time they're wanting to go see if elijah has wound up on some mountaintop but these are mostly no doubt young men so their curiosity gets the better of them and when they urged him till he was ashamed he said send they sent therefore fifty men and they sought three days but found him not and when they came again to him for he tarried at jericho he said unto them did i not say unto you go not and the man of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. So the water of Jericho is bad. They can't drink from it. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt in there. And said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So he just takes a little bit of salt, mixes it with the water, and it's all good. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Of all the water on the earth, I would say that was the most trustworthy to drink at that time. <laughs> okay. And he went up from thence. Now here is a peculiar way to end this chapter <clears throat> and Elisha went up from thence from Jericho to Bethel notice how he's now backtracking retracing the steps that they just took and he went up from thence unto Bethel and as he was going up by the way there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him go up thou bald head go up thou bald head you may be thinking that this is the little children like portrayed right here. This is most certainly not. There's about, well, there's dozens of them. We know that. But little children, Solomon, at about 20 years old, <clears throat> whenever he's praying to God, he's 20 years old and he refers to himself in his prayer to God as a little child. So we know that in the scripture, a little child can mean a teenager. Uh, early a man in his early 20s 
So I'm guessing that these are young men, probably 18 to 25, and a bunch of them. This is a gang of them. And also notice what they're saying to Elisha. There's a lot more here than meets the eye. Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. You see, the word had reached the townspeople about what had happened to Elijah. It no doubt spread rapidly. It's one of the most known events in the world right now even. And has been ever since. So this word had gotten around how Elijah had gone up into the sky. And these would have been pagan young men, 20, 21, 22 year old pagans and a bunch of them. Matthew Poole says, go up, go up into heaven, whither thou pretendest that Elijah is gone. Why didst thou not accompany thy friend and master into heaven? So they're just mocking him, mocking Elijah and mocking God. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. Now it says that there's forty-two, but it says there are forty and two children of them. That's how many that were actually killed or slain that day by these two bears. There may have been a lot more. I'm imagining this was a gang of young men gathering themselves up like a mob coming up to Elijah, Elisha. They hated the prophets of the Lord. Russell H. Dilday says this, Since 42 of the boys were struck by the bears, the group may have been quite large and therefore dangerously out of control. Elisha may have needed miraculous intervention to escape. So let us not see this as a cruel act from Elisha or from God. This may have been very necessary. And for the final verse, and Elisha went from thence to Mount Carmel, and from thence he returned to Samaria. So he's tracing his way back, goes to Jericho, Bethel, then comes all the way on up here to Mount Carmel, and then he makes his way back to Samaria. It's believed that the reason why he goes back to Mount Carmel is to the spirit of Elijah is <laughs> quite possibly working in that manner, just as it's working in the way of John the Baptist later on. That, and what I mean by the spirit of Elijah is how he has that same like-mindedness. The Lord is so heavy upon him at that moment that he's almost just like Elijah. But that is it for this magnificent chapter. I love the, both these chapters equally, but man, you really just can't get much more epic than Second Kings 2 about what happens to Elijah. But now we will see Elisha. This young prophet, he now begins his prophetic ministry, and it's very fascinating. Very fa A lot happens from here on out to Elisha. I hope that you all learned something today. Until next study, God of peace be with you. Amen.